turn my mic up. Boy, yo. Take there. Yeah, yeah, uh. On the road to the riches. Life takes a toll like bridges. Good friends become foes and snitches. Better watch who knows in your business. All right, cool. We sound good, bro. All right, let's let's get it rolling, man. Hustle fam, hustle fam. We are back with another amazing episode, and I think we have a special one on our hands today. I'm here with my brother, Mike Stewart. Mike, what's good, my brother? Hey, what's going on, man? Man, it's, it's, it's great to have you, bro. It's great to have you in the building today. I, I have a feeling this is going to be a great show. I think you're going to add a lot of value to the family. Um, you know, first, I just want to, you know, kind of just put some context I actually discovered you, uh, 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 first came across you on social media. I saw a post that you kind of put out there, and I don't know how I stumbled upon it. And you were basically talking about, I think you were at a uh, either a toll or it was a way station or something like that. And, you know, a guy was kind of telling you, he was like, man, you know, if you if you keep this up, you keep working, you know, one day, you know, you could, you know, have a truck of your own, you know, one day. And you was like, yeah, you know, I actually do have a truck of my own. He was like, oh, that's... That's dope, young brother. He was like, well, you know, maybe one day you can have a couple trucks. And he was like, well, actually, I do have a couple trucks. <laughs> and then he was like, uh, you know, well, man, why are you driving? He was like, yo, it's just not time yet, man. And I just, and just, you know, the, the, the way you came across in that video was so humbling, your spirit and everything. It really resonated with me, bro. And just to see a young brother like yourself doing that, it was, it was special. Just the way you kind of explained that story. And then on top of that, you know, when I kind of researched a little further, I saw that you were in the tankers. Right. You, you, yes. you, in the tankers, which, you know, you don't see a lot of, a, a, a lot of people getting into that, into that niche. So I was like, man, this brother's special. Not only has he built a company for himself at a young age, but he's also doing tankers. So I said, I got to get you on the show, man. So here you are, man, after that long introduction, man, <laughs> welcome, welcome to Truck and Hustle, bro. Great to have you here, man. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. For sure, for sure. All right, so let's get into the backstory. Um, Mike Stewart, do you got do you like Michael or Mike? Which one you prefer? Mike, Mike is cool. Mike, Mike Stewart, Reliant Tank Division. Um, that's your company, right? Um, let's talk about it, man. First of all, just to kind of put some context around it, tell me about your company. What, what, what do you guys do? Um, how many trucks do you have? Talk talk to me a little bit about that. All right. Um, we're not that old, established in 2017. Um, we have nine trucks and I think, uh, about 15 or 16 trailers. And, uh, we started off hauling fuel or, or any type of gas product or whatnot. And just like all work or type of work that's out there, things can, can get slow. And so when the, the fuel or tanker side of things slowed down, we reached out and reached out to reefer and from reefer, we moved on to flatbed. And from flatbed, we move on to a rollback tow truck. And then, and then we just took the hazmat world by the horns by hauling reefer hazmat and flatbed hazmat and straight truck hazmat. So um, that's kind of what we do at this moment. And therefore, there's no slow season and, and we're steady. Okay. All right. So let's get into it. You said you started your business in 2017. Talk about your backstory a little bit coming up. Where are you from, first of all? Let's start there. Okay. From Bakersfield, California. Okay. Started driving trucks at uh, the age of 23. I'm 34 right now, by the way. Um, and I started with CR England. <laughs> okay. And, and, it, and I, honestly, it, it was great. I, I mean, it was a really good experience. Um, within nine months, as a company guy at CR England, I was able to purchase uh, my first truck. And then six months later, I was able to get another one and uh, just had two trucks with CR England, got frustrated, sold both trucks, got off, uh, you know, came home from over the road, went to a local company right here in Bakersfield hauling fuel. And that's when I fell in love with that and um, worked for that particular company for six months, figured out the program, worked for another one for five years where I had to not only be a driver, but I became a manager and a terminal operator and everything like that. And with all that experience, I wanted so much for that company that I worked for. Uh, I wanted them to be bigger than what they were. And I don't, I believe they didn't believe in themselves. So um, as I, I, I just, I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't make that company 
become better than what they were. So what I ended up doing was I, I left and started my own. And within two years, uh, Reliant passed them up. And That's interesting. Now, what, what do you mean by that? You wanted that company to be company to be better than what they were. What was their, what, where, where were they struggling? What was the challenges in that company? Uh, as, as being a manager and driver at the same time, you get both, you get the best of both worlds. You get to understand the driver complaints and, and what the issues your drivers are having. But then when you, when you're on the management side, you're like, well, what can we do about this? Let's fix this. Let's change that. And let's slow down the turnover rate. So, I mean, you got, we're hiring a hundred people and losing 120, you know, every year. And so I wanted to slow that down and I knew the keys to slow that down, but they just wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't hearing me, man. That's just what it was. Mm. And so I took that experience into my own hands to start my own. And, and right now we have one of the lowest turnover rates that I know of. So. Wow. All right. We're, we're going to get back to that. Let's rewind a little bit. Let's take it back to 23 years old, driving for CR England. What did you do when you were driving with them? I was a company driver. I was on my own for 90 days and I became a trainer, a, a phase two trainer. And I did that until I was eligible to become a phase one. And so that whole time, um, I had a mentor of myself, um, a mentor of my own, I'm sorry who gave me game and showed me what to do, what not to do, you know, don't lease a truck versus being a company guy or buying a truck and things like that. So I saved up everything I had to buy my first truck. So you, this is your haul and dry van at this time with CR England. What do you got? What are you guys pulling? Reefer. Oh, you're doing reefer. Okay. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Got you. So what, what made you want to drive a truck to begin with in the first place? My dad. Okay. My dad's a truck, my dad's a truck driver. So um, I always wanted to do it as a kid, but if we, if we take a couple steps back, I, I still didn't want to be one. My goal was to be a mechanic. Okay. And so I made it, I, I made it as a diesel tech for uh, UPS and it was a great job um, and I got laid off. And, and when that happened, I had to come up with a plan and truck driving was that plan. Okay. Got you. So you were a diesel tech for UPS first Correct. And, then, and then the backup plan was driving the truck. Correct. Now, did your dad own his company or was he a company driver for somebody else? He did both. Okay. He, did both. he was a company guy and he was also an owner operator and, and things didn't work out. And so he's, he, he's to this day, he's still an, uh, a company guy right now. So, okay. Okay. That's interesting. How come he didn't come work for Reliant, man? You know, I, I would love for him to work for Reliant, but he's 30 years in where he's at. Mm. and i didn't want to mess up his uh retirement his tenure yeah and I, and it's also pressure man it, it's it's easier to say oh my dad works for the line but it's <laughs> pressure comes with that you know yeah yeah what, so, what, what kind of pressure are you talking about you're talking about uh favoritism you know i i could i could have a guys that's 15 drivers that are here now and and pops come along and just go straight to am ship with weekends off and it's kind of like, well, that's my dad, but at the same time, you the last man on the on the on the waiting list, man. Right. So what do you do? Right. Right. And, and nah, that's interesting. That's 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 very true. Very true. All right. So you said you uh, started with CR England. You're you're driving reefers. You said you had a a trainer, right? You were with for a little while. Uh, when I started, yeah, I was okay. Training. And you said yeah. ni after ninety days, you said you went on your own, and then you said you what did you say about the ninety days? Bring that, bring me that back again. Uh, within ninety days, I, I no, was it ninety days? October. You became oh, okay. a trainer. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I was in training for. I did thirty days in phase one and forty five days in phase two. Okay. And then within ninety, I, I was a company driver for ninety days. Okay. And then from there, I was able to purchase my first truck. Okay. Got you. And how, how was that process? What, what made you want to jump into that so fast? I realized that that paid the most because as a company driver with Sarah England, you don't, you don't make nothing. And, and if you want to make more, you have to become a trainer. What were they paying at the time? I want to say it was 22 cents a mile. Okay. As, as a solo uh, company driver. Okay. Got you. So what was the deal that they put on the table for you to purchase your own truck and, and kind of move up in that way? Um, I, there was really no deal. I kind of just wandered into the sales department and I found an old seven century. <laughs> it was red. 
Okay. Uh, they were asking $27,000 for it. And um, at the time I had, I had $8,000 cash straight up. And uh, they were only asking for seven, 7,000. And my credit was trash. <laughs> and so she said, your credit is so bad. Um, let's, you need an, an additional $1,000. Okay. So come back when you got it. Okay. And by the grace of God, I had it. I'm like, right. I have it. <laughs> right, right, right. And so anyway, and so I, I was able to get the truck, but I honestly was like, when I say broke, like zero dollars. Cause when I got the truck, I, I wasn't able to buy like an air freshener, a floor mat, no nothing. All I got was that truck. Yeah. And and from that moment, um, you know, they gave me a truck number. I picked up a student or a trainee, uh, and we hit the ground running. And and when I got my first check it was amazing. And, and from that moment on, I realized, you know, this is what you want to do. You really want to own it and, uh, you know, grow from there. What was it? Do you remember the number on that first check? What you, what you made? If I were to guess, I think within a week, it was probably about 2,500 bucks. Okay. It was something like that. Yeah. Okay. Got you. And you said you picked up a trainee. So that was to get additional money on top of that, right? Correct. You, you, you make more money because you're getting more miles. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Got you. Got you. So, so you do that and you said you're pulling uh, reefers with, with them for a little while. So now you're, you have your own truck, but you're under CR England, right? Correct. Correct. Okay. Got you. And then you decide to get another truck. What makes you decide to do the, get the second truck? Growth. And, and it just made sense. Um, and, and also I was following the footsteps of other fleet owners and, um, and it just only makes sense. It's either you take all this money that you're making and invest it into the truck, and which I did, I paid it off really fast, and which allowed me to buy the 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 other one. Now was so, the other one an older truck as well, or was that newer? Uh, it was newer. It ended up being a 2009 Cascadia. Okay. And it was decent, and um, I found another driver for that one, and after that, I honestly went home. <laughs> I went home and became a bum. <laughs> <laughs> I, I gotta be honest. Hold with on, you. man. Hold on. What's going on here, man? What's going on here, man? You what do you mean you went home and became a bum, man? What are we talking I, about? I mean, because I, I think at that time I was 25, 25 years old, um, not married, no kids. Right. I'm making money. I didn't have nothing to do. You know, I, everybody's dream is to really go home smoke drink and not do nothing and i honestly did that i did right, it right right but i'm glad i did it at that age um because i want to say it kind of took away my the the drive it's like well what do i do get back in a truck and and, and buy a third and fourth and fifth and it's a headache you know what i mean these drivers you know you you try to i, I overpay and that's one thing that i learned if you overpay they stay right and I usually do that. And so I, I would never have a problem with paying drivers. I would have an issue with how they would take care of the truck. Mm. You know, it's one thing to not see your truck for two, three months and you, you finally see it. And there, I mean, there's horror stories that come with it. You know, you'll have a truck that's all beat up, bumper ripped off and your driver won't tell you. Right. Or, or you could say, hey, we have an open account at a truck wash and uh, they never get the truck washed. Right, right. Just little stuff like that. And it, and it really frustrated me. And I realized that, you know, maybe this is not for me. And so I fixed the trucks. I sold them. Uh, and then I just went home and uh, became a company guy and just started driving and hauling fuel. Cause I'm, and the reason why I chose fuel was uh, because it's, it's one of the highest paying local jobs you can get out the gate. Okay. Okay. Got you. Now, did you have to go and get those additional endorsements back on your license at that at that point? Or did you already have them, the hazmat endorsements? I had them from day one. Why? Because when I was in orientation at CR England, they told me in the, the whole class that, hey, if you guys spend the extra $80 and you study to get your hazmat and tanker, there'll be a time uh, where you might need to haul fireworks or there may be a time where uh, there's no drivers available except the hazmat loads. And you will be the guy that's not gonna sit. You will get that load. And so I was one of the few in the whole class to actually get it from day one. 
Got you. All right. So you so you literally you 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 bought your own truck with CR England. You bought another truck. You hired an employee, right? You got your driver now, but you end up just dissolving that entire situation because it's just you just it was just too much for you. You just you wanted to chill. You wanted to hang out, right? Like I, I was just, yeah, young. I want to chill. <laughs> I want to hang out, and I took it to the head. You know, what I mean, mean, financially, were you doing okay though? Like, what would make you stop? I was good. It was it was it was too I, much I for you. It, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. It was too much for you at the time, like too much of a headache, a burden. Like what, 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 if you're making money, you, you, you're progressing, you're scaling, you, you go from one to two, what will make you stop? I'm just trying to understand. The perfections and, and the frustrations is what will make you stop. Like I would, it, it's hard to, to spend all this time and money to like buy trucks, you know, and you know, them. you know, I keep the trucks polished and, and detailed and I, and I'm all about appearance. And so when I would go out and see a unit or, or a, a truck, I know where he's going to be. I'll go look at it and I will be disgusted, man. I would, I, I just couldn't understand how people could, how they treat your, your equipment. And I was, I would take that personal. I would take it personal. And I, and I didn't know how to, how not to, <laughs> because, you know, when I drove for, uh, when I drove uh, with CR England, I, I took their trucks to the truck wash. I kept them clean. I, it smelled good. It was decent. Uh, I would be called stupid for getting it polished. But I'm like, <laughs> I want it to look, I want to look decent. This right. is what I'm driving. Right. And so I wanted uh, my drivers to keep that same energy and they didn't. And it just made me want to say, you know, I, I no longer want to do this. And that was really, it wasn't even the money. It was just uh, being a perfectionist, I guess, you know, is the best way I could word that. That's interesting. How, how many drivers did you end up having with CR England? One or two? Two. Two. Okay. So, mm -hmm. so you had the two trucks and two drivers for those two trucks. Where'd you find those guys? Trainees. Okay. Oh, they were your yeah. trainees. You brought them on and you put them on to your trucks. Correct. Okay. Correct. So, so in, in my time at CR England, which was four years, I believe I ended up having 67 trainees and, and some you have for 30 days, some you have for uh, two or three days, depending on uh, how they want to act hygiene based on, you know, whatever the case may be. Right. But I, I stayed in contact with every last one of them. So just to see how they're doing, see how far they're going to go and to let them know that uh, they will always have a job working for me, you know, if they don't, want to be a company guy for CR England and CR England was okay with that. They will allow you to hire their drivers through their training program uh, for your, you know, for your benefit. Okay. Okay. All right, cool. So you said you end up selling those two trucks, right? I did. Yes. And, and, and immediately you went and got a job uh, hauling fuel. Nope. Okay. <laughs> what'd you do then? Talk for to three me. months. I didn't do anything. Best time of your life. <laughs> I took, I took a, 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 a extreme vacation. I didn't even go anywhere. I just <laughs> you had to de you had to decompress. It was all I that did. all those years, just that four years. You had to just get four out of the years. system. Yeah. Four years, man, of, of yeah. all these different trainings. And you're a young guy too. At, at at on top of that, you know what I mean. Yes. yes. So you had been taking life very seriously. You you had a a, a whole lot of. Uh, a stress and, and a whole lot of responsibility. And it was like, man, let me just relax. Facts. Okay. Okay. Got That's you. So at what point did you know it was time to get back to work? You, uh, and, and what was the thing that made you decide to say, all right, I got to stop this, 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 this madness. I got to get back in, in, into work. I, I knew it, it wouldn't last forever. Um, and then, you know, it's just like, you know, I, I had no choice really. Right. Had to go, you know, had to go back to work and had, to make, had to make some money. Yeah. I, right. I, I went, I went straight ahead and applied to all the hazmat companies. Um, and, and then that was another reason why I stayed with England for so long is because, I mean, I was happy there. I made good money, but a lot of these companies don't want to hire you if you only got nine months of experience, a year, year and a half, two. So I figured, you know what, well, let me do four. Right. And, right. and that, as soon as I put in the app, man, they, they called right away. Got OK. So you had to have you got the hazmat experience with England. I did. OK, you did. OK, so you, I thought you were just hauling reefers with them. I didn't realize you were doing hazmat. See, you, you could put hazmat in those reefers. OK, got you. Got so, you. I mean, once you I turn like that reefer off, it, it's pretty much a drive in. 
Right. And right. and uh, so you just haul, you know, maybe a tote totes of chemicals, um, maybe a load of fireworks. That's very common. Uh, stuff like that. So. OK. OK. Got you. So you start hauling fuel. Are you are you scared? Because I know if I'm hauling fuel, I'm terrified. I wasn't. <laughs> OK. I, it was like it was something that I was made to do, honestly, because within. Um, I remember uh, being in orientation with two other guys and I was just so hungry and so focused, so ready. I, I learned from my trainer's mistakes, hauling fuel. Yeah. Because you make mistakes hauling fuel. You could put gas into a, a gasoline into a diesel tank or diesel into a gasoline tank. Right. You just mess up the whole gas station when you do that. Right. So I, I've had trainers that do, did that while I was in training and I've, I've witnessed it. I watched what they did wrong. And I learned from it and I was able, um, and, and I was, and then I took on the hardest job. The hardest job in fuel was considered real hose. Real hose is a position where you, um, you have hoses uh, that you run off and, and you, and they're, they're coming from the tank of the truck and you're just putting fuel in different, different places, not gas stations, okay. but above ground tanks, you're doing a lot of pump work and stuff like that. It's very complicated, but. I chose that because it was the hardest and, and I loved it. So, mm. And I'm sure there was a, 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 a premium that comes with, with that, with doing that type of work as well. Right. Top pay. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I figured why not, why not, why not go to the top? And, and, and that's, that, and, and no one else wanted to do that. Yeah. And I remember uh, being so young and, and uh, having other drivers that work there saying, you, you ain't going to be able to do that. And, yeah. but I just ignored it and, I did it, and I work. I gave them six months of of, of hard work. Um, they gave me a suspension of something I didn't agree to, and I left. And the day mm. I left was a, another uh, company, a fuel company that was moving to Bakersfield. Okay, I happened, I happened to go there the day they moved, and I helped and I started it. Mm, got you, got you, dope. All right, let let let's stick with hauling fuel real quick because I just want to touch on that. Real fast. Um, what are some of the, you know, if somebody wants to get into that, into, into hole and fuel, what are some of the things that um, the, the main, mis- you, you just mentioned one of the mistakes that people can make. Give us, give us some more things that if someone is young getting into that, like, what do you have to look out for? Just give us a little bit of game on, 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 fu- on fuel hauling. Um, you have to learn how to triple check, meaning every move that you make, you need to check it three times. Um, and it's all about routine. So, I mean, and when I say routine, we all have a daily routine. I, I bet when you wake up and you put your socks on, you may put your left one on every single day. And if you were ever to put the right one on, you probably would never would do that because it's not in your routine. So some people put socks and pants on, or some people put pants on then socks, but however they do it, you're gonna do that for the rest of your life. And so fuel is the same way. Meaning, um, once you find out what product you're going to load, if it's regular premium, regular is 87 gas, by the way, regular premium diesel, you already know what, you know, the three you loaded, and then you have to drop an order. So whenever you make your deliveries, diesel is always first. You do your diesel, you do your premium, and you do your regular. If you try to get out of that category, or you skip a beat, or you try to take a shortcut, you will cross dump. And cross dump is the definition of putting diesel in the regular tank or regular into the diesel tank. So in other words, uh, tanker fuel, it's just all routine. Okay. So where, where does your day start? Just to get, just cause I, I don't really understand the tanker business like that. So you, you start you pick up somewhere, right? And then you're delivering to different fuel stations. So can you explain how that kind of works? Okay. You, what you'll do is you'll get a dispatch and it will tell you uh, exactly how many gallons uh, of gasoline, premium, or diesel that you need to get. And once you have that dispatch, it tells you which refinery to go to because you may go to a different refinery every single day because of the price of fuel. So for example, if price of fuel is in, in Bakersfield is really cheap, you can get it here in Bakersfield. Uh, if it's cheaper in Fresno, which is two hours north, you're gonna get it from Fresno. 
And once you get your fuel and your dispatch will tell you what gas station you need to go to. And it'll tell you, uh, give you basically an address and you go to refinery, you load up exactly what it asks you to load and you deliver what's required. So is that a decision that you're making in terms of where you pick up the fuel from? Because you said you could, it's like priced differently in different places. You go to Bakersfield, you go here. So as the owner, are you saying, all right, we're going to get the fuel here because it's cheaper and we're going to, how does that whole process work? That would be based on the customer. Okay. Okay. So the customer, the customer is dispatching you? Correct. Okay. So the customer, let's say A, B fuel, A and B fuel, right? ABC fuel is saying we need whatever amount of gallons of fuel and they're going to send you a message or email. How does, how does that work? Like take me through the whole process. That's exactly how it works. Okay. (laughs) So, so and this is the day say, before or the day of, like, like uh, the whole. It'd be the, it'd be the day before. Okay, and, and it's on a daily it, 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 or it, it, weekly. Um, go ahead. Is it on a daily basis, like a weekly? Do you have your dispatch a week ahead, or do you have it the same day or the day before? Talk about that. Day before. Okay. It won't be weekly. Um, okay. So, for example, it, it 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 fuel is tricky because let's say it's a holiday coming up. So everybody's getting fuel Friday night and Saturday. So therefore, uh, you need to get that fuel either at a low, at, as no matter what the price may be, you need to get it there ASAP or that station will have a run out. So, um, but other than that, that's that's how the dispatches are. It's just more of a, hey, we own A and B gas station. Um, it looks like we're, we're going to need a load of regular. Uh, we need we need diesel and we need a lot of premium. People are traveling this weekend or whatnot. All right. In fact, can you send two trucks? Let's double the fuel. And then let's say you get to a station and you have too much fuel for them to receive. They'll have a sister station and you can take that to the next one and you help that gas station out. OK, do you, do you have a certain amount of times that you'll touch a specific station per week? How does that work? And, and, how, and how do you know which stations you're going to be touching every week? Like, is there a certain radius that you'll cover? Like, how, how does that work? Uh, some of these gas stations, man, they have over 200 gas stations. Okay. So it's kind of more, um, it's all about <laughs> whatever they want and wherever you're going to go. Because it's not just you, you know, you're competing with all these other tanker companies. Okay. So they may give us five stations to do in a day and they'll may, may give the next guy 10, 20, or however many there may be. So h- how do you how do you get that customer? How does that work? Like, are they looking for you? Are you looking for them? Do they find you? Do you knock on their door? You knock on their door. Okay. And you say, hey, this is Mike. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a driver with Reliant. Uh, we have truck time. Um, we have tanker trucks that we can haul fuel for you. Um, if you guys need help with this station, we would love to serve you or... If you need help or if you know anyone else that needs help. So it's all, almost a uh, word of mouth, really. You're just knocking on the doors, man. Hmm. That's, yeah. that's, in, that's interesting. All right. So, um, okay. So, and, and who are you talking to at the, are you talking to like their, where is the dispatch located? They have like a corporate office. I'm just trying to understand the whole, everything works, the whole cycle. Okay. Um, so what you do is you, you like from day one, you go talk to a store clerk. Okay. And then you ask for the store manager. And ask him, how much fuel do you guys need a day? And he'll tell you, oh, well, you average one to two. And you say, who do I talk to? How do I get fuel to give to you guys? And then he'll give you another guy. And you'll talk to him. And he goes, hey, what, what can you do? And then that, from that moment, it's all about the rate. So fuel is rated in, in two different categories. You can go price per gallon. Uh, and, and it's very complicated when you go that route, meaning um, – we want you to give us 3,000 gallons of diesel and then you will charge them point whatever per gallon of diesel, point whatever for premium, point whatever for a regular. Or you just come off top on a, a straight up hourly rate. And that's what we do. I mean, that's it's a game changer because everyone that I spoke to was by the gallon. But mm. I figure, hey, if we are a company that's at $160 an hour and it takes us 14 hours to do this shift. This is the math that we're going to give you. And that's, that's how we do our rates. Right. So you have to kind of price the, the fluctuation of gas into that hourly rate so that you're never under on that rate. Right. Because it's, it's only, but so high gas will probably go. Right. It's not even the price of fuel. 
Okay. That's that's more of for the consumer. Like we don't have to worry about none of that. Okay. It's just what what does it cost us to pay a driver to go load that fuel and make that delivery? And then gotcha. and, and if you're too high, you know, 160 an hour is high, but why not? But but they're paying for that fuel too, right? They're paying for the delivery and they're paying for the actual fuel. They will so, pay for that fuel. They pay for the, the whole dollar amount of that fuel. Yes. That, that, that's what I, that's why I'm saying, like, so they have to well, I guess you're just putting that cost on top of what they're paying for the fuel, so it doesn't even matter, right? Correct. Yeah, the, okay. the price, the price per gallon per fuel doesn't really pertain to the to the haulers. Right. We're not even in the loop to you're be not honest. In, got you. Nah, because the way it worked would be, let's say right now in California, it's five dollars a gallon. And the gas station owner can probably buy all of it at three dollars a gallon, and then he'll sell it at five, and then they'll make their money off of it somehow, some way. Got but, you. But, so right. you just have the transport in. So they're basically they have the relationship with the what? What is it? Where do you pick up all the fuel at? What is that called? Uh, the refinery. Refinery, right? That's the word. Okay. So you're you're they have the relationship with the refinery. They get their fuel prices from them. Right. So they know, OK, it's such and such per gallon. They say, OK, I want you to go to this refinery and pick up this amount of fuel for us. They're paying them that. Right. That amount right. has nothing to do with you. And all you do is a transport. So now you're saying we're going to tack on our hourly rate or our per gallon rate to that number. And then you invoice them that. Correct. OK, that's exactly how it works. So that's why it's up to them to let you know where they want to buy that fuel at. Because they're buying it, not us. Got so, you. Yeah, and it's and it's pennies on a dollar. So it, it's that's it's, interesting, man. Oh yeah, I, man. I, 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 all right. So is there ever a time where like you like okay, you'll talk to the customer and they'll tell you to pick it up from one place, but you'll say, man, it's it's cheaper over here. Why are you getting it from there? Or you don't get involved in that. We're we're not involved in that. Okay. that that's a whole nother world. <laughs> <laughs> that's what they do. Okay, that's, that's on their sales side. So. I mean, and it's crazy because right here in the city of Bakersfield, we have a few fuel refineries and we can go a whole month to get it to two hours north uh, in Fresno mm. and not get it here at all. Got you. Price. Got you. Got you. All right. So how, how much fuel does it how, how much fuel does a typical uh, fuel station or gas station consume like in one delivery? Like how, how much fuel are you hauling usually? Average is eight thousand seven hundred gallons. 8,700 gallons. That's common. Yep. That's that sounds like a lot of damn fuel. And how long does that last? It depends on the size of the station. Like if, if it's a Costco, uh, oof, they'll probably go through that. They'll probably go through that in about three hours. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Three hours gone. So how, how many, how many trips are you guys making? It's it's just it's it's a bunch of them. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I mean, you you could end up going to the same place um, the same place multiple times in one day. Correct, but but based on distance, we could probably only do two fuel stations. Okay. So that's when you got to send multiple trucks, and then there's so much fuel in, that we can't keep up with it. So you have other carriers that do it. Okay. Okay. Now, do you have relationships with those other carriers? So let's say you have a relationship with this customer. But you can't you can't handle the capacity. So you will call one of your friends and say, hey, man, you know, I, we need some extra capacity. Give me a, a little piece. And then, you know, you can take on my customer. Like, how does that work? Because I'm sure that you don't want to have other companies cut into your your work. The fuel world is, is so big and small at the same time where we're all we're all in cahoots. OK, we all know each other and we all know that if I was. Uh, behind on a customer and I reach out to you to help me, that would be more of a double dispatch. Okay. And so that would mean, uh, let's just give an example. Let's say they give me a thousand dollars to deliver to one gas station. And then I have another care, uh, customer or a, a, a co, a co-employee or I'm sorry, co-worker, yep. co-company, yep. somebody that we could work with and say, Hey, uh, what do you say? I give you, 900 bucks to do this gas station right they'll be like man i can go to customer direct and do it for a thousand why would i get that from you right 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 so so therefore you just gotta say you, hey, you it's what it is you just it is what it is. You can't, you can't handle it you can't handle it you can't handle it 
because everybody knows everybody. It, it's small. Yeah. Got you. So you. You can't. But once you're in, you're in. And you can get favors. Um, let's say you have a, a X amount of tanker trailers that's not working. And then uh, you need some, uh, an extra trailer. And then it's a favor for a favor. Or let's say you got more trucks than they do and no one has spares at the moment. You can swap trucks. It depends on your relationship. Wow. Okay. Do you have to have like an interchange agreement? Or, uh, is that how that works? Or you just kind of just... It depends on who you know. Who you know? Okay. It's, it's all about favoritism. I mean, there was a time where um, I had a truck with uh, the company that I was working for, and it broke I, It broke down. And I had no choice but to use a company truck. And I used it. They charged me to use it. And then there was a time where their trucks, so many of them broke down, they needed to use mine. Mm. And I didn't charge them. And what I did was create that give give some take some and it was all free so the next time i had a truck down or out of service they let me use this for free and i just kind of right barter and trade yeah and it worked out got you that's dope so okay so like you said it's a small small world small industry everybody knows everybody how do you stand out like how do you or do you even need to stand out because the need is so great to where it's like they're going to use every tanker company that they can or is it like how, how do you set yourself above the others to where they'll go to you first it's all about your performance if you got a team of guys that are not cross dumping which means putting fuel in the wrong tank if you're not doing station runouts meaning your drivers are so late that the gas station runs out of fuel and now people are at the pump and they can't get fuel um it's really about your performance and if you outperform the next guy these customers are going to choose you first Got you. So are those the, like, like the two uh, major KPIs, the cross dumping and then the runouts? Is that the ma major things they grade you on? Major. Got you. Anything major. else? No, that, that's it. It's all about performance, performance okay. and professionalism. That, that's really what it boils down to. Because these cross dumps don't sound like much, but when they happen, it's million dollar problems. Because if you don't catch it soon enough, it goes into somebody's car. And then now you got somebody driving their uh, gas powered vehicle rolling around with diesel in it and it messes the motor up. Wow, has it ever happened to you? Never, not, not to me, knock on wood, but it's happened and, yeah. and, it's, and it's chaos because uh, if you do it at a Costco, you're gonna have 40, 50 cars all stalled around the neighborhood. Some people make it from the gas pump to the parking lot. Some people make it to the street. And then next thing you know, you got all these cars broke down. Then wow. you got all these tow trucks coming in. And it's and then you got all these other tanker companies coming in to suck all that fuel out. You got to suck it all out. And, and each tank is 30,000 gallons. Have you ever seen something like that happen or heard of that happening? I have, yes. So so what was the, the end result of that? Like who got sued? Who paid for it? Like how does that work? Is there, does your, would your insurance cover something like that? It, 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 it'll go through your insurance. Because it's too much, you know, yeah. you not only, and that's why I said it's million dollar problems because yeah, yeah. You got 50, let's say 50 cars. You're paying for all of them outright. <laughs> motors. And this is motors. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes they can drain the fuel tank yeah. and save the car. Um, yeah. But now you got to pay for rentals. Um, so you got rentals, motors, tow trucks, companies, impound yards, uh, all these lawsuits of this and that. And then, and then all that, you got to pay for the, all that fuel. You have to buy all that fuel. Right. And it's right. contaminated. So you have no choice but to give it to a refinery that's going to refine it. And let's say it was $5 a gallon. They're going to give you 50 cents to a dollar per gallon. And they're going to break it down and resell it. Wow. Wow. Okay. What about the run out? What happens in, in, in that particular case? Obviously people are waiting for fuel, but are there any other penalties that you can, you can, uh, that you would have to endure based on that? Or is it just kind of like somebody's just sitting there looking at the, looking at their wrists? Like where you guys at? What's going on? Uh, the, the gas stations make their money off fuel sales. So let's say, uh, like basically when you get a dispatch, they'll tell you, you need to be there between 1 PM and 3 PM. And you show up at six, you're three hours late. The, the station's out of fuel. Right. And so now that station can't make that money because most people buy the fuel and then they go inside and buy uh, chips or whatever they want. That's all sales. 
So without the fuel, all you can rely on is people to come in and buy snacks, and that's not going to happen. Right. And if you see all those uh, out of service on the on the fuel handles, people pull up and they leave right away. And so what fuel stations can do when you run them out, they can charge you. They could say, hey, we want anywhere from 500 to 1500 per per hour that we are out of fuel until your driver gets here. Oh, wow. They can charge you that? Oh, yeah. And you have to pay? You have to. <laughs> what you going to do? <laughs> Damn. So, so basically, you got to pay for their loss. Like, we're not making the money, so you got to pay for it. You got to pay for it. Wow. Wow. So is that in the agreement? Is that a part of the contract? Like it's if, all part of the contract. Yes. So if, if they, if you, you're contractually bound to get it there by a certain time, I'm sure you have like some, some kind of grace period or something like that. Right. No grace period. Nah. So if, if it's not there, they can start charging you on an hourly rate based on the number, the amount of money that they'll lose because that fuel is not there. And that not only includes the fuel, but everything else that the, the customer would have potentially spent. Correct. <laughs> That's, okay. that's I, mean, crazy, bro. I mean if there's like a fatality on the freeways and they're shut down yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Like you can't that one's fine if there's a fire and you can't get to it um that's that's really the only two excuses or, or if the refinery shut down or uh and you couldn't get the fuel to begin with then you're okay with that but other right. than that no man you're gonna get charged so have you ever had a situation like that never Oh man, you flawless, baby. Let's keep it going. <laughs> <Not for> <laughs> you flawless. I, I love it, man. I love it. All right. So let, let's talk about real quick, just get like, like startup, getting started up for somebody else who wants to haul fuel and get into your business. Uh, what are like the startup costs to, to, to purchase a, a tanker trailer? Can you tell me, tell us in like insurance, can you tell us a little bit about that? Ooh, we, so, um, really, um, I honestly don't have a price on startup costs because tanker trailers are anywhere from 10 grand to 150,000. But it just depends on if you want to go used, brand new, or it depends on if it's in test. In test means this trailer is ready to go. It's certified. You can ha- you can load it up with product. It's not going to leak. It's going to pass all the tests. If you buy a trailer not in test, you have no idea what this, tra- this trailer is going to do. And so what you have to do is you have to spend money to, um, anyway, make it past test. But uh, initial startup would be um, a truck, a truck and a tanker. Yeah. Same thing with a truck. You can buy a used one. You can buy a, a, a brand new one. Uh, but whatever you want to do, you want to buy a mid-roof to a flat top because some gas stations are, are, are really low. They don't have the clearance of a regular big truck. Mm. So. Gotcha. Are, are there any other additional certifications, anything else that you have to have on your insurance that somebody else wouldn't have to typically have um, that would be an addition for hauling the, uh, the tanker? Yes, you would need the state hazmat license and the federal hazmat license. And, and then also you need the, the hazmat insurance. Now, if you're starting out, you will not qualify for the hazmat insurance because you have to have the hazmat experience. So the best thing to do is to be a company driver uh, for two years to get that experience. And then you wanna be a subcontractor driver for the fueling experience. And then you wanna start your own where it's just you. Gotcha. And that's four years of experience right there. Um, but it's, it's definitely worth the wait because if you try to go direct and I've seen my friends try this and it did not work out for them. Got you. They just couldn't get they couldn't get the uh, the certification. They just couldn't no. get it. right because either, either either they had the fuel experience um, as far as driving, but they don't have the fuel experience as 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 a um, subcontractor. Got you. So you need that four years. Is that the amount of time that they're kind of looking for? On for, for my opinion, yes, because the, because it, it's three things. Um, it's all about the insurance. The insurance will say, hey, well, yeah, you hauled hazmat for two years uh, as a company guy, but we're not going to give you insurance as an owner operator. So what we want to see you do is be a subcontractor for the next two years. And then, or you could split it up. You could be an owner op for one year. I'm sorry. You could be a company driver for one year, and then you could be a subcontractor for one year. That's going to give you your two years. 
And after that, you can uh, talk to the insurance and hope that they'll approve you with, with that amount of experience. Got you. Got you. So when you got started, what were some of your challenges? Number one, like that you just faced kind of early. And then number two, how did you get started? Did you, did you get started with a trailer that was brand new in tests or did you get started with, with a, with a, with a reef when you had to refurbish and rehab? How, how did you get your business started? You know, um, okay. So I, I was subcontracting. I sub hauled for a fuel company and I had one truck and, and I was rocking and rolling with that. So the minute I reached out for insurance, they said that, hey, you already qualify okay. because you have the sub hauling from way back with England. You have sub hauling now for your fuel. And then you have years of fuel experience. Yes, we can give you the insurance. So when I got that green light, that's when I went trailer shopping. Okay. And I found this old trailer. It was 1989. Um, but I, it was in test. The, the guy wanted 29000 for it. And I financed it and I took the one truck that I had and, and I, then I had my, combi- you know, that, that's my combination. It's my truck and trailer. And, and, and prior to getting that trailer, I already had went to go knock on doors at refineries and told them what I had. And this one lady straight told me, she said, well, pull up, we'll get you loaded tomorrow. And wow. I didn't. I didn't have a trailer. <laughs> you was fronting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was fronting. But see, that moment, at that moment, I realized, like, okay, you want to- Work is up. there. Yeah. Right. And so when I finally got that trailer and I pulled up to her specifically, it was too late. They had already found another carrier. So, but what I took that, I took that as a lesson. And I went to another refinery with the truck and trailer, um, W9, copy my license. I didn't, I didn't know. And proof of insurance. And I pulled up, told her this is what I had. Um, this is what I can do. And from that moment on, from for some reason, uh, she said, you know, I'm gonna give you a test run. I'm gonna give you seven loads to see if you can handle this. And if you handle it, we'll put you on. Mm. And uh, me and, and one driver, we handled those seven loads. And from that moment, as a minimum from that particular refinery, they've given us 67 loads per month. Oh, wow. And that's and, dope. Uh, yeah, man. That's dope. That's dope. So, so the key is the refineries building a relationship with the refineries because then they'll give you access to the cus- to the, to the customers that need the fuel. Right. Correct. Correct. Got you. Got you. Got you. All right, cool. So you said you start, so, so we're, we're, we're building a story here. We're getting to, we're getting to current. All right. So you, so, so now you, you said you started out with you and the one driver. So is that both working on one truck or did you end up getting another uh, truck with a trailer? Both, both on one truck. Okay. Got you. See, so I tag team in that truck. Um, yeah. And then you start building the business. How did you know when it was start, when it was time to start building and growing your fleet, getting more trailers, what happened to you to make you move on to that next level? This, this is the good part. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Okay. So me and this one driver, I'm, I was uh, AM, he was PM. We're running loads uh, two days a week. I'm sorry, two, two loads a day, seven days a week. And we're just rocking and rolling. And I happened to run into this guy who actually uh, met me at the refinery. And we're on camera, by the way. And this guy is just like drilling me, man. He's like, yo, who, who are you? Who's Reliant? Where'd you guys come from? And I told him, you know, we're out of Bakersfield. We just started. Yeah. How many trucks you got? And at the time, one. I said, it's just one. And he's like, man, this is BS. And he just drills me. He's all in my face, wanting to fight and everything. And I'm just backing down, man. I'm like, look, man, my apologies. I didn't mean to upset you, but I could talk to who I spoke to to try to get you on. Because he, he told me he had four trucks, but he um, was subhauling with those four trucks. It wasn't customer direct. And so that was, that is why he was so upset. So anyway, uh, I talked to the lady in the office. I, I, I called her and I said, look, I had an altercation. And she said, oh, don't worry about that. We saw everything on camera. We really liked the way you held yourself. Um, you, you kept it together. You didn't get upset. Um, we, we do want to let you know that we gave that guy a lifetime lockout. He can never come to our refinery. But, um, and so I'm sitting there speechless, like, man, I just cost this man his job, not on purpose. Um, and then, and I go, yo, she was uh, drilling me on having a fleet. 
I'm sorry, he was drilling me on having a fleet. He kept telling me that you got to have a three truck minimum. And I wasn't aware of that. So I asked the lady at the refinery, uh, is it true that I'm supposed to have three trucks to even be in this refinery? And she said, it's true. And then I was shocked. I was like, wow. And then I, it was a dumb question. I go, why me? Why did you give me that that chance or or just put me out there? And she said, it's all about your attitude. And, and then I love the way you pulled up with that truck. You really pulled up with a truck. Everybody can say they have a truck and trailer, but you came with it. You came in here not knowing nothing. You didn't know who to talk to. You didn't know who I was. And she said, your approach was everything. Um, your honesty was everything. And as of right now, I want to encourage you to buy two more trucks so you can meet that, that fleet minimum. And I said, okay. And then right away, um, I called the Peterbilt dealership. They had two trucks on the line that was ready to rock and roll. And um, I went and got them. <laughs> and so, and then didn't even have a, um, trailers to go with them. So I had to go trailer shopping. Wow, man, that, that, that's crazy. There's, uh, there's uh, two, two lessons in that story, man. Number one, just... Um, just like you said, just showing up, being transparent, you know, just, just the, the lady obviously saw something in you um, and she saw that, you know, you, you were somebody that she wanted to do business with. But then the second lesson is you didn't let that guy trick you out of your position, man. You know what I mean? Because that could have very well been a situation to where it could have went a different way. And here right. you are on camera tricking yourself out of you. And, and, and that could change the trajectory of your entire business. You know what I mean? I, I I feel like we wouldn't we wouldn't even be here. The size of the company wouldn't even be where it is if it wasn't for that. Right. And, right. and it was just yeah. It, it 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 touches me every time because even if it even if it wasn't for that lady to even give me that chance, Shot. I couldn't say that we would be here. Yeah. Nah, that's dope. So obviously, after she said that, it was go time. You said, "All right, say less. <laughs> say less. <laughs> say less, man." So, and then from there, uh, money start rolling in. And the next thing you know, I'm driving to Salt Lake to buy another trailer. Um, then I financed another trailer. And then we had a yard that only held five trucks. Um, we, were at, we were at five trucks quick. And then we had, the, the, the yard got too small. So then we moved to where we are now, which holds 15 trucks uh, and trailers. And, and it's too small. So we're already looking for, and dude, this this wasn't that long ago. It's been two and a half years. So, got you. All right, cool. So now let's kind of get towards where we started off when you said COVID hit, right? And right. you started seeing that you needed to not have all your eggs in one basket, and you started making some changes. So tell me about that. What happened? And then tell me about how you started transitioning to all these other other different niches. Talk about that a little bit. Um, it, I was uh, definitely under pressure. So it's like, wow, we, we're nothing but tanker. And we went from having um, seven tanker loads a day down to two. Now I have all these drivers with no work. And I didn't want to put people on the couch. I always say put people on the couch, you know, that's sitting on stuff like that. Um, so uh, under pressure, uh, I'm, I'm jumping, I get on Craigslist. I'm looking at reefers, flatbeds. I'm looking at every type of trailer there is. And I, and I scored a, a reefer for five grand and then another one for seven and another one for eight. And the next, and then I had all the units serviced to make sure they're working properly. And then I just put all the, uh, I, I got on the load board. <laughs> I had to get on the load board. We, we were never on the load board. We were just customer direct. So um, we, uh, we, we grabbed these reefers. And I jump on the low board, Trucker's Edge, trying to figure it out. What can we do? So we start hauling um, food, uh, grapes, cantaloupe, you name it. We're hauling it. And, it, and I realize it's, it's trash. It sucks. It's not made for local guys. You know, it's made for the guys that's got sleepers who can take four hours of load and four hours of offload. So uh, my drivers are not feeling it. I lost some drivers behind it because their pay didn't change, but they had to actually, you know, they had to work more. And, and with fuel, you load yourself, you unload yourself, you're in and out, it's really fast. But 
with reefer, you got people loading you and unloading you and you're on their watch. And so uh, the drivers aren't feeling it. I'm not feeling it. And then I'm thinking like, you know what? Let's get some flatbed. So I get on Craigslist again, I find a flatbed and then I finance a flatbed. And then I realize it's better. It's cool, but it, it wasn't paying as much. It didn't, it didn't, it didn't, it doesn't pay more than reefer. Uh, but your your in and out times as far as loading and unloading is faster. And then by looking on the load board, uh, it's like a, this light bulb just popped on out of nowhere. And I'm like, you know what? We're hazmat certified. We call anything that's hazmat. Let's look for hazmat loads. So then we started looking at um, reefer hazmat hauling uh, Tesla batteries for Tesla. Just all kind of stuff that requires a refrigerator to be on, but it's still hazmat. Like the, I guess there's like a type of oil that we use for uh, footage when people, you know, with, for film and stuff like that, all this chemical stuff. And then we started doing flatbed hazmat, uh, with, which are totes, hauling the corrosives of this and that and the other. And then those rates were so high compared to anything else. That's, that's really what we're sticking to. So now, instead of us being 100% tanker, we are about 50% tanker. 25% reefer hazmat and 25% uh, flatbed hazmat. And to this day, even right here in Bakersfield, California, there is no competition. It's, it's, it's a, a lane that is unheard of or unspoken of. And it's so big, I'm, I'm willing to tell you about it because it's, it's so much out there that everybody wins. And so. Wow. So, so what's so dope about that story, man, is out of the chaos, the confusion, not knowing what you're going to do, you had to create a diff, find a different niche for yourself. And that niche ended up being even better than the current niche you were already in. <laughs> By far. By <laughs> Which far, is crazy. Man. Which is crazy, man. Yo, that is, that's awesome. So now you said you're, you're 50% fuel and then 25% flatbed and 25 reefer hazmat? Correct. Wow. Wow. That that's that's awesome, man. That is awesome. So what's the current what's the, the entire outlook of your operation now uh, in terms of equipment? Just just to get the big picture to kind of bring it around full circle. We uh, as far as equipment, um, we really rock Peterbilt and, and Kenworth. OK, how About many one, how, how many trucks? You said nine, nine, nine trucks. OK, how many trailers? Fifteen, 15 trailers, 15 total. Correct. How many tankers? Eight. Eight tankers. And then... Let me write this down because I may be off. <laughs> no, no, I'm sorry. I take that back. We're at nine tankers. Nine tankers. Nine tankers. We got three reefers. Three reefers. And we have two flatbeds. Got you. Now, this hazmat work, is this is this OTR or is this like local jobs? Or, or is All it local. Mixed? All, All local. local. Yeah. Wow. So these guys are home every day. We even, and, and because we are tanker, um, uh, this year we, we actually just jumped into a food grade, food grade tanker. And so, um, and it, I tried, you know, I, I come in thinking like, hey, we're going to haul milk. Let's see what these rates look like. Let's see if we can compete with these people. And we tried it and we were trash. It wasn't made for us. And I'm okay with that. Like, it's like, you got to try and fail. And so what we ended up doing was saying, you know what, milk's not going to work for us. Let's haul orange juice. Let's haul uh, lemonade or something. And when we reached out to that, uh, the customer goes, hey, you guys are hazmat, right? And we're like, yeah. And they were like, we want to give you guys wine and pruno juice. Both are hazmat that required that needs to be in a food grade tanker. And, and that's what we were at that like right now. Wow. Wow. That's crazy, <laughs> and, man. That's and again, it's a, it's a lane that nobody has. I don't know anybody that hauls wine uh, <laughs> or Pruno. Prun, what is it? Pruno? Uh, you know, the, the I don't even know what Pruno juice is, bro. But it, it's, it's like it sounds uh, expensive. <laughs> nah, it, it's basically like what you make in prison. You know, when you take the oranges. Never been. I don't know. In the, in the lemon. OK, it, it's a drink that you make out of rotten oranges, pretty much. And OK. Drunk. Okay. And that's, and that's what we're hauling. <laughs> wow. That is crazy. That is crazy. And all this stuff is hazmat specific. 
And because you, be, because you created this niche for yourself, you have these opportunities that, like you said, nobody no, nobody else really has, man. No, no one. <laughs> and, and the customer is, was upset because they were like, well, we want to give you a drop trailer style. And that's something new to me. I've never had drop trailer loads. A drop trailer load would be you, you take a trailer to a customer and they'll keep your trailer right. and they'll load you. Right. And then you keep one at your facility and when it's time to go grab that load, swap load, out. you swap out. Yep. And we only have one food grade uh, tanker. <laughs> and I'm like, we just got it, man. We was trying yeah. to all flip with it. Right, right, right. They try to take it from you ready. <laughs> we're not ready. So now right. I'm like, okay, now we're in a hunt for another uh, food grade tanker. And that's and, and we tried it. I mean, even for, um, and let me back up a little bit. Even prior to buying all this equipment, we signed up for power only. Um, and, I, and I know there's drivers out there that understand power only, and there's some that don't, but all it is, is just your truck and you reach out to a customer. You can, you can talk to Snyder and you'll pull their trailers. You can call, talk to JB Hunt and we did it and it was trash. <laughs> it, did, it didn't pay, man. It wasn't worth it. Right. So then we jump on UPS, uh, power only FedEx power only big dogs, two thumbs up. So you could be a man out there with a truck with no trailer at all, and you could pull all these people's trailers. But it's almost everything you do. If it's big, you don't have you. You're not going to lose. Right, right, right. You said earlier when we first started the show that um, <clears throat> you wanted to be the change. I'm I'm kind of paraphrasing. You wanted to kind of be the change that you didn't see in the other company that you worked for, right? Like you, they they weren't they weren't doing their best or they weren't living up to their full potential. Right. And you said that when you started your company, you have like almost like zero turnaround, right? What, what, what's, what's your secret to that? How, how are you keeping your drivers, especially in this climate where, you know, drivers are such a, a commodity, right? Because there's not a lot of drivers. Um, how are you, how are you holding on to your drivers? What, what's your, what's your secret sauce, man? Okay. Um, if you overpay, they stay. And not only that, um, as an owner, if you really get next to them and you work side by side with them, they respect you a whole lot more. So there's nothing that this dr a driver can do that I can't do. So when they have an issue or if they have a shift that I feel is underpaid, I will, I will bump that pay up. And they don't, have, they don't never have to ask for a raise or anything like that. Um, I give them, I work weekends. I give them the weekends off. So I try to, I always put the drivers first. And so, and they respect that. Right, right. Now, I love that. I love that. And that's important, man. So you, 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 you're in the truck, you're, you're right along with the troops, getting it done. Every day. I every drive day. every day, man. <laughs> every, day, every day. That's dope, man. That's dope. All right, man. Well, we've been rocking for a second. You know what I'm saying? We're going to start kind of wrapping the show. Uh, before we go, we have to get your final thought. That's just kind of like what you want to leave the audience with. And um, then we got to let everybody know where they could connect with you, whether on social media, um, where, you know, email, so forth. If somebody's looking for a job, a position, if you have an opening, so forth and so on. And, um, you know, let, let's do that, man. So first, uh, unless there's anything else you want to leave us with before your final thought, because, I mean, we've covered a lot. Um, yeah. let's, let, let's, let's get into that final thought, man. Leave, leave the audience with something, something motivational, something spiritual, wherever you want to go with it. Um. If, if you got a, I mean, there's a saying, if you can't beat them, join them. And I've taken that saying and said, if I can't join you, I'm going to beat you. Mm. And I told that to my previous employer. Um, they were a $30 million company and they were doing well. And I, and what, the things that I wanted for them was I wanted them to have a NASCAR. I wanted them to have a stadium. I wanted them to have their own jets. I wanted them to have a company on yacht that can be used for their drivers as a vacation, as a, here we go. I wanted them to give away cars for Christmas. I, I you know, I, I just, I just thought too big for them. And, and all of those ideas they laughed at. <laughs> and so that's my goal. I want to give away cars to drivers on, on Christmas. Um, I want us to have a, a NASCAR. I want us to have everything that I just mentioned. And, and that's that's major. I, mean, I want us to have a radio station. <laughs> I want us to have 
the sky's the limit. There's nothing that you can't have. And so what I, in conclusion, um, when you have big dreams like that and you got people that are shutting you down or, or don't believe in you, you just have to stop talking to them. And then you can share it with the next. And then sometimes your dreams are so powerful that you can no longer share them with nobody. You just got to share them with God. Mm. And then when you get there, it feels good. <laughs> <laughs> man, bro, that was some powerful words, man. Mike Stewart, Reliant Tank Division. Where can the people reach out to you and connect with you, my brother? Instagram. Instagram will be the best. Uh, the name on there is Mike Stewlery, and it's M-I-K-E. S T E W L E R Y. Um, that that'd be the best way to hit me up. You know, if you got questions or thoughts, or if you want to chat, you know, if you want to buy a tanker or a trailer, FaceTime, you know, I'll give you some game and want to see you out there. So no doubt, no doubt. Bro, this has been a dope conversation, man. I, I appreciate your time, your energy, <laughs> your effort. I learned a lot. Um <laughs> I could talk to you for another hour, man. And we, we got to do this in person again some at some point, man. I'll be in Cali soon, so we definitely got to connect. I'm with it, man. That 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 works. That for works. Sure, bro. Young brother, 34 years old, doing your thing out here, killing it in the everything game. Tanker, reefer, all that stuff, man. Killing it. Proud of you, bro. Keep on doing it, man. Keep on growing. And we looking forward to seeing that NASCAR and that, that, that company oh, jet real soon. I'm watching. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you man. You, you, you just put it out here, man. So we, you know, we, we going to hold you to it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's I like that. That's pressure. I'm about to go get in the truck right now. <laughs> we going to hold you to it, bro. Hey, bro. Salute to you, man. Thank you so much for joining us, Hustle Fam. You know how we always do it. If you smell something burning, it's only a desire. Me and Mike, we are out. Mm. All right. That Peace was fire, man. bro. That was fire. If you twisted, confused, or stuck about trucks, don't be dumb. This is the place to come. Truck and hustle. Let's go.